Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. We broke Season 2's first episode, How Will COVID-19 Affect the Fatty Liver Community in 2021, into three separate conversations. In this conversation, the second one, the surfers and our guest, Dr. Manal Abdelmalik, discuss the value of treating NAFLD and NASH in the context of reducing COVID-19 severity, and then explore strategies to keep fatty liver patients engaged in clinical trials. Hope you enjoy this. Hope you learn a lot from it. Drug developers, investors, researchers, and corporate executives wrestle weekly to understand what is happening in commercial development of NASH medications. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, and forecasting and pricing guru Roger Green as they discuss the issues affecting the evolving NASH market from their own unique perspectives on the Surfing the NASH Tsunami podcast. I was just thinking when you were talking and listening to what's going on around the world, and we've repeatedly discussed, and there's a lot of evidence come out at Digital European Liver Conference and the Digital American Conference, that we know that fatty liver is playing a role in um, driving a lot of severity and mortality. If you look at the UK uh, biobank 10% 10% liver fat with obesity in those that were obese. Um, although that was only 50% of that population, it tripled their risk. Now, we had an obesity strategy and drive following Boris Johnson's illness to get people to lose weight with, without really measuring it and with the only just telling people to lose weight, get eat less, move more, uh, same old, same old, which a lot of people don't respond to. Whereas... I wonder if what we could be seeing, and this is me speculating here, is that we know that 16.4 million people in the UK and nearly 100 million Americans have fatty liver disease. And the quicker this variant spreads through the population, is there a risk that because we have not diagnosed those patients, that they are the ones that could be ending up in hospital at a quicker rate? Because we're just spreading this virus now very, very rapidly. Um, but we've not prepared them. We've just simply told people to lose weight. We haven't told them to, it's their liver fat that we're trying to reduce. We haven't been able to identify those characters. But with 16.4 million people at risk, and both Oswald and Easel said that patients with fatty liver disease and NASH were at risk, um, those are massive numbers of pay patients and people who could be fueling this influx into hospital and what you would expect to see is younger with less comorbid diagnosed conditions presenting to hospital. You know that's the paradox Louise is these are the at-risk patients but we have potential uh, significant treatment opportunities for those patients to help them with their liver disease if they could make it in to our clinical trials. You know, gone are the days of just kind of testing the waters in fatty liver. No, the drugs we have now are very, very good at defatting the liver. Many of them are. And and I think that that has borne out in some of the trials that were presented in 2020. And those trials have moved on to later stage trials uh, in 2021. <clears throat> And we know that that by defatting the liver, we've we've seen positive impacts on inflammation and fibrosis as well. The issue is um, twofold. Number one, just today we had a, a cirrhotic patient cancel their screening visit because they were concerned about being exposed to COVID and coming into, you know, getting in the car driving here, opening the door, coming and sitting in a waiting room, even though everything is set up, as you say, what it hands, face, and distance. So we do that in our clinic, but still patients are appropriately concerned. And, and on top of that, then my staff are also affected. Uh, I don't know how many of our staff are currently out with COVID or their spouse has COVID or their kids have COVID whole households, uh, three out of four in my family had COVID. Uh, and, and so, you know, I was out for 14 days socially distancing. And when you have 
enough of your PIs and sub eyes and clinical research coordinators and phlebotomists out, you can't effectively run a clinical research division. And then you have patients on top of that that are scared. So that's the paradox. We have potential life-saving treatment, so to speak. And I use that because we're, our trials aren't designed at these early phase studies to show life-saving intervention. But, but we have shown that we can effectively defat livers. And we know that, that that may, may be impactful if they were to get infected with COVID. So that's part of our dilemma, uh, Roger, to your point. Uh, there's no doubt uh, all of our studies are shifted to the right. Clinical trial enrollment uh, is proceeding despite the daily new record numbers of COVID, but it is a challenge and it's probably, you know, a third to almost a half of our patients less than we would normally be seeing uh, as a result of this pandemic. So, uh, you know, enrollment, as long as we see high rates of COVID, NASH clinical trials, I would suspect all clinical trials are going to be uh, significantly slowed in, in their enrollment. I don't know, Manal, do you agree yeah, with that? I, I, I do agree with that. And, and you know, we can look at this whole phenomena, which is really um, uh, beyond belief, uh, as the glass half empty or the potentially glass half full with a lot of challenge and adversity comes opportunity for innovation and discovery. And while we have seen a blunting of um, uh, uh, progress in, in clinical trials recruitment, and even on the clinical care front, delays in access to care or patients presenting with, with a, a more advanced uh, hepatocellular carcinoma because they missed a visit or didn't get access to clinical care during the time of COVID. So what otherwise would have been manageable had we been in the normal uh, uh, way of doing and providing uh, medical care to our patients is now presenting at later stages or with more uh, advanced disease or complications. With that has also come a different way of doing business in the context of clinical care and clinical research. Uh, we've we've resorted to telemedicine and, and video visits. So we've, we've found different ways of, of delivering care beyond patient visits and potentially even delivering clinical care in the context because it was a um, shame to not allow, as we've talked about with vaccination strategies, new therapies in the context of, of novel targets and novel drugs being uh, rendered accessible to patients in need. And so in the same way that we talk about new frameworks of providing access to vaccinations, we need to start thinking about different frameworks by which to render uh, timely, appropriate uh, interventions for our patients with chronic disease and move away from the concept that it's going to eventually go back to business as usual. Because in my opinion, I, I don't think it will ever go back to business as usual and providing medical care and providing access to medical research differently. Um, but when you take a look at the field overall, it is, is, it is really um, encouraging and exciting what has uh, uh, unfolded in new developments with drug therapeutics and biomarkers despite the era of COVID. We saw multiple innovative uh, studies and outcomes presented both at the ASL meeting and the EASL meeting that should inspire us that we can do more and we should be doing more, and the resiliency of the human spirit does potentially overcome because we have moved progress forward despite uh, significant hurdles in making advancements in the field of apple and ash. Okay, I'm going to take some numbers I think I remember from previous episodes and see how this goes together. Stephen, I think you estimated at one point last fall that there was going to be a need for 11,000 um, clinical trial related biopsies, say, in a over the next year. Do I have that right? Well, what, yeah, just to clarify, we, if to enroll what's in clintrials.gov, mm -hmm. phase two and phase three, we need about 11,000 NASH 
biopsy proven NASH patients. Right. So to, to get to there, we've actually got to screen about 24 to 25,000 fatty liver cases. And how many patients are there in the U.S. who have clinical NASH at a level where they would be responsive to the drug in question? Oh, many more than that. I mean, there's yeah. you know, probably 25 million with with NASH, uh, and we we would expect that uh, many of those would respond. It's it's a matter of disease awareness. Again, paradoxically, I think COVID has brought that to light, at least in the UK and uh, and, and other places where we're we're seeing fatty liver come up in the same conversation with COVID. But, but make no mistake, it, it, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge disease awareness issue. I, I I agree with that, and as Louise points out in his, today, and as we've all discussed several times on this podcast, exercise more, eat less, is not um, a viable long term strategy for most people, particularly if they're not seeing their doctors. We said we said last year was a problem that we should see them once every three months. Now it probably is more than once every three months, and people are more depressed and they're spending more time in their homes, which was likely to push them towards worse habits. I was reading alcohol sales in the U.S. are at 54% over uh, 2019 and 2020, and my only surprise was that the number wasn't higher than that. Um, so it seems to me that there's a huge challenge around mobilization. And part of that challenge is education, but part of that challenge is hope. And the problem is that the vaccine is, in theory, the beacon for hope. But that's rolling out here very slowly, as you pointed out. I mean, um, somebody I read said that at the rate we're going right now, we could vaccinate the entire U.S. population in 10 years. So there will be a new normal. How does that new normal start to mobilize hope or the or belief better in an era when the drugs are coming, but they're not here yet? You continue to beat the drum of of good news. You begin, you continue to put out, you know, continue to put out positive data, and and I think those good news stories get told and retold and retold. You know, maybe it starts in a clinical presentation. Maybe it starts in a press release. Then it, uh, then it makes its way to a publication. Then it makes its way into a CME lecture, or it makes it your, its way into a throwaway journal, or it makes its way to a patient advocacy group like GLI or uh, the Fatty Liver Foundation or others, and it begins to socialize through social media and other web-based channels. That heartbeat of positive data doesn't have to slow down because of COVID. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to really drive that. And part of the reason we started this podcast, Roger, was to do just that. Yep. I agree fully that education is going to be key. And we should not... Um, uh, uh, dampen or or um or or delay the the dissemination of innovative scientific information but i've also found that interestingly those patients who are motivated and those centers that have the capabilities can execute clinical studies and access to new therapies in very new and innovative ways um for clinical care i've had uh uh, nutritionists and exercise physiologists get on Zoom meetings and exercise virtually with a patient at home or, or render nutritional innovation. We have used um, um, web-based media to, uh, to render education through, you know, for example, the, the International NASH Day on a virtual platform, which could be more broadly accessible to patient advocacy and patient or, uh, groups that are within our own practice. Uh, we sent out the link to all the patients with NASH in my program so that they can access information, even though they didn't have access to a provider to get such information. And interestingly, um, and I've had the same experience as Stephen has, despite 
staff being sick or patients being um, resident to come to the portable study center, we've started doing uh, consenting via Zoom-based works, uh, sharing of, of uh, informed consent, rendering um, knowledge about uh, drugs and drug trials to patients on a virtual platform, and effectively implementing screening strategies that are predominantly virtual with what we have defined as a lab and leave visit. One of my coordinators one time was was had a patient who was reluctant to the site for drug drug pickup. So she was innovative enough to do the uh, drive-by drug pickup where the patient came by, popped open the trunk, cheap event medication in a patient's trunk, popped it closed, and then as soon as they got home, proceeded to do the uh, virtual counseling session uh, about drug administration and, and, and drug accountability. So it doesn't have to be business as usual. It just has to be business done differently. And it doesn't mean to say that it would be any less effective or any less impactful and yet allow us to render access uh, across different platforms. Now, that really does step on the buy-in of multiple different entities that have to come together. But CROs and sites and investigators and even federal regulatory in, in, um, agencies to how we can be innovative in drug development pipelines and drug development um, programs to allow for a new normal, such that we can not stagnate bringing uh, promising drugs to FDA review and potentially to market because of a new normal. So I loved the lab and leave, and I loved the minimal visit interaction that can be rendered and all patient quality of life questionnaires so that they put on a home portal as opposed to having to come into my clinic and use an in-clinic tablet or fill out an in-clinic paper uh, form. We have to be more uh, out-of-the-box thinkers here. And one of the things I love about that is that, for example, what you said about the nutritionists and the exercise physiologists, that doesn't have to be limited to people in clinical trials, right? So now if it's better, work out more, eat less, now we will actually give you professionals who will work with you on a personal basis remotely. You know, and that doesn't have to be limited to folks in trials. It certainly doesn't have to be limited to folks in trials. And, and as opposed to having the framework where care is center centric, mm -hmm. where you have to come to a center, I think we need to shift our mindset to uh, that care is going to be in pockets of of outreach to our patients, such that they can receive the necessary education, the necessary care, the necessary interventions for clinical trial participation, more in their home based level as opposed to a center based structure. Um, and allow that to still happen within the constructs of regulatory compliance. Manal raises a lot of excellent points there, because what we do know, there's a lot of evidence that people who want to do weight loss programs do better if they're in a communal environment or a shared experience. Now, that can be online because at least they know there are other people there than they do as a single person trying to motivate themselves. They're more likely to keep weight off. So we know that that sort of method works. It may also be one of the reasons that placebo do so well in clinical studies because they're one of they're part of a group, rather than that whole individualized perspective that you don't get too much. You're left to do it on your own, and just even knowing that there's somebody else there like you is a real positive motivator for uh, for change, even in a placebo arm. And I think I've seen it in multiple trials that they befriend each other. They sit in the waiting rooms together, they share phone numbers, they share experiences, so they motivate themselves. And I think it may be one of the confounders for the placebo responses that we see in fatty liver studies or any study that requires weight loss. But I think for going on in, in future care, Manal's perfectly correct, we won't go back to the new normal. So much more diagnostics, non-invasive, will now be done in the community setting so that you get, as a physician, a better level of quality of patient referral so you can make decisions online without seeing the patient or the decision to see the patient. I think we will move in liver disease and in lots of other disease fields in that way. 
And I think we've discussed it with Donna before and Stephen, things like Noon, a lot of these wellness sites and websites that people can get into for motivation, for um, reassurance, for counselling, they will come into their own if we can get the message across. Um, and I think, so Manal's perfectly correct. We will create a newer, improved normal for lots of people. And the old normal will be better for other portfolios of patients. So let me take the last few comments and try to tie them together. Hope is coming because the drugs are because better drugs are, are arriving. We're developing modes of treating people remotely, which are currently being adapted for clinical trials because that's where the urgency is greatest, but can certainly be uh, administered or used for patients who aren't in clinical trials, but just are trying to use whatever conventional methods exist. Particularly if we can do that with a sense of community, which can be virtual community or real community. Drug developers, investors, researchers, and corporate executives wrestle weekly to understand what is happening in commercial development of NASH medications. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, and forecasting and pricing guru Roger Green as they discuss the issues affecting the evolving NASH market from their own unique perspectives on the Surfing the NASH Tsunami podcast. Again, this is Roger Green. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire conversation idea in general, please send an email to me at questions at surfingnash.com. We are releasing three conversations in total from this episode. Our next new episode will release on Thursday, January 14th. Stay safe and see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.